on, so I will not forget later. Um, I want to thank you all for coming to this presentation of the Shamama case, Contesting Citizenship Across the Modern Mediterranean, the new book by Professor Jessica Marglin that has recently appeared with Princeton University Press. The book tells a riveting story of legal conflict across the 19th century Mediterranean and sheds light on the history of belonging, citizenship, and Jewishness. Um, now, before I introduce Professor Marglin, uh, I just want to say a couple of words about our center, many of you familiar with our activities, both at the GC and Queen's College, but if you are new to our events, perhaps you heard about this talk uh, through HNET and would like to learn more about the future activities of the Center for Jewish Studies at the Graduate Center and the Center for Jewish Studies at Queen's College, we'd love to hear from you. Please email us so that we can keep you informed and add you to our mailing list. I'll make sure you all start contacts in the chat box in just a moment. I also want to mention that Princeton University Press is providing a discount code for Professor Marglin's book, which I will also put in the chat box momentarily. As you can see, this talk is being recorded. It will be later uploaded to the YouTube channel of the Center for Jewish Studies at the Graduate Center. I want to invite you all to please keep your microphones muted during the talk. After the talk, we will have time for questions. Please feel free to use all of the tools that are available to you to ask a question. You can use the hand raise function on Zoom. You can type out the word question in the chat box. We'll make sure to call on you in the order that we receive. And of course, if you are unable to unmute yourself or you would prefer to type the question in the chat box, uh, please do that and we'll read it aloud for you. And now it's finally time to introduce our speaker, Jessica Margling is Ruth Ziegler, Early Career Chair in Jewish Studies and Professor of Religion, Law, and History of the University of Southern California. Uh, she's currently a fellow at the Katz Center uh, of the University of Pennsylvania. She worked on the history of Jews in modern North Africa and the Mediterranean with a focus on law. Her first book was Across Legal Lines, Jews and Muslims in Morocco. It came out with the Yale University Press in 2016. And it was a study of Jews in the Moroccan legal system in the 19th and early 20th century, and it won the 2016 Baron Book Prize of the American Academy for Jewish Research for Best First Book in Judaic Studies, as well as the National Jewish Book Award in the Sephardic Cultural Category. She's also the co editor with Matthias, with Matthias Lehman of Jews in the Mediterranean, and her second monograph is the exciting book that she will present today, the Shanama Case. So without further ado, Jessica, the floor, the floor is yours. Okay, hi everybody. Um, I hope you can hear me okay. Yes, good. Um, welcome all from wherever you're joining in. I think some people are coming not just from the eastern end of the Mediterranean, but from North Africa as well. It's wonderful to have you all here. Um, I'm, I'm gonna start by <clears throat> just uh starting the powerpoint can everybody see that okay yes great excellent okay good um it first of all really deep thanks to francesca and arnold for inviting me to speak with you all today um it's really exciting to be here and um uh and and i, I really look forward to the conversation um after after i present a little bit of the book um so please do you know ask questions in whatever mode you feel comfortable doing so so I'll begin with a story. On Friday morning, January 20, January 24th, 1873, sorry, this is, there we go. And um, one of the richest men in Italy, in fact, probably one of the richest men in Europe, died suddenly in his palazzo in Livorno, which is on the coast of Tuscany. It's this Tuscan port, sort of not far from Florence. Uh, his name was Nisim Shamama. He was a Jew originally from Tunisia, um, and given that he was so rich after his death, the search for a will started immediately. Shamama himself had never had children, uh, despite having been married three times to two women at the same time at one point. Um, and because of that, there wasn't an obvious way in which his wealth would devolve after his death. However, since before he had left Tunisia and moved to Europe, he had sort of adopted essentially um, 
his favorite great niece, a woman named Aziza Shamama. Aziza was the daughter of Nisim's nephew, a man whose name was Shlomo or Solomon, but everybody knew him by the nickname Kaid Momo. Um, however, Aziza and Momo had fallen out a long time ago, possibly even sort of before she was born because Mo Momo had divorced her mother. Um, and so she had sort of become very close to Nisim Shamama, moved into his house first in Tunis and then followed him across the Mediterranean. And when her own son was born, whom you can see in this picture, she named him Nisim after her favorite great uncle, um, instead of naming him after the kid's grandfather, which would have been the which would have been customary, um, uh, as is the case among most Sephardic Jews. Now, Aziza, of course, was very concerned about what was going to happen uh, after Nisim died, because Aziza and her family had been living off of Nisim's largesse for decades now. After Nisim died, they found a copy of his will. The will split up. Here's the family tree. So here you see Nisim. There is Momo, his nephew, Aziza, his great niece, Nisim Jr. I call him Nisim Jr., Aziza's son. The will, which was written in Judeo-Arabic, um, divided up the estate into four parts. One quarter went to Aziza, another quarter went to her son, who at the time was nine years old. And then the remaining two quarters went to two of Nisim's three surviving closest male relatives. So he had three surviving nephews, Momo, Nathan, and Joseph. Everybody else in this tree was either female, which means they didn't automatically inherit according to Jewish law, um, or dead by this point. Um, now, uh, of course, uh, as anybody who has ever either lived through an inheritance or studied inheritance knows, fighting over an estate is probably as certain as death itself, probably even more certain than taxes. And of course, this is particularly true about any inheritance that involves large sums of money. So literally within hours after Nisim's death, the will was being contested by others who stood to inherit much more if the will was deemed invalid. And I'll explain all of that in a second. But before that, I need to say a little bit about the law that sort of governed who, how Nisim's estate was going to be um, divided up. And that all goes back to this man, Pasquale Stanislao Mancini, who was by far one of Europe's most famous international lawyers. He was a hero of the Risorgimento. Um, he was the first Italian professor of international law, which was a kind of new um, field at this time. He also helped to draft Italy's new civil code. And I'll just remind everybody that in 1873, Italy, as Italy was a very, very new country, right? The Risorgimento, the sort of nationalist movement to unite Italy into its own nation state, really only gets started in earnest in the very late 1840s or early 1850s. 1861 is an important year, but this, the civil code doesn't get written and passed until 1865. And there's still kind of ongoing contestations about the shape of Italy, actually well into the later part, the latter part of the 19th century. So Mancini was really at the center of all of this. He was this really important lawyer, very important politician. Um, and he came up with something known as the nationality principle. The nationality principle is a principle of private international law. Um, international... International law is usually, we usually think of international law as being about states, right? How do states relate to one another? But international law actually has different branches and private international law is really much more about individuals. It's about people who cross national borders. And then, you know, there's some kind of legal question, right? So having to do with marriage, having to do with a contract or having to do with an estate. Now, the dictate, uh, the, the principle, the nationality principle in private international law essentially dictated that the law regarding matters of personal status, so marriage, divorce, child custody, and for our important, for our purposes, the most important inheritance, should all follow the national law of the individual in question. So let me explain a little bit what this means. We expect that if, you know, if you are, uh, let's say, a French person and you come and live in America and you die, well, then normally American law would apply. But the nationality principle says that actually, no, because you are French, it doesn't matter where you are in the world. If you die in America, American courts should apply French law to your estate. And similarly, if you're an Italian dying in France, right, then Italian law should be uh, applied to your estate. This is, uh, I mean, for those of you who are interested in kind of the history of the 19th century and nationalist history, 
this principle is really, really a big part of nationalism because it's essentially putting nationalism in legal terms because it says that a person's nationality and thus their national law is so important that it should be respected basically no matter where they go in the world. So it's really Mancini's job, essentially, his whole profile, but including in the nationality principle, was to marriage nationalism and international law. So that's what the nationality principle does. So thanks to Mancini, who wrote the relevant part of the Italian civil code, the Italian courts knew that in order to distribute Nisim Sharama's estate, they had to figure out what was his nationality. Where was he a citizen, essentially? Now, this proved more complicated than you would have thought. Nisim had initially applied for Italian nationality uh, in 1866. However, it wasn't totally clear if he had actually got it. And I'll talk about that later on. If Nisim died in Italian national, then Italian law would apply to the estate. And then everybody was very clear that the will would be respected, right? Aziza, oops, sorry, no, no, too soon. Aziza and Nisim Jr. would inherit half of the estate, right? Nisim's will would totally hold according to Italian law. However, if it turned out that Nisim had not died an Italian citizen and instead had remained Tunisian, right? Because remember he was born in Tunis and he had come to Italy from Tunisia, then Tunisian law would apply. What did that mean in this case? Well, Nisim Shamama was Jewish. Jews in Tunisia were under Jewish law, under halakha for matters of personal status. Again, marriage, divorce, child custody, and the important one for us, inheritance. So, in that case, Jewish law would apply to a state. And it was pretty likely that Jewish law would not consider the will valid for various reasons, which I'm happy to get into, and instead would go to the kind of biblical distribution of inheritance, which would split the estate equally among Nisib's three closest surviving male relatives. So Joseph and Nathan would each get more. They would get a third instead of a quarter. So they were like, yeah, let's, let's have him declared a Tunisian. Let's have Jewish law applied. And then most importantly, Momo, Kaid Momo, Aziz is a strange father, who, by the way, at this point, if you hadn't guessed it already, was estranged from Nisim, thus cut out in his will, right? Momo would, in, would inherit a third of the estate. Rather, than, he was given like 25,000 francs in the will, but that was really nothing. This state was, a worth, was worth close to 28 million francs, which was just a vast sum at the time. So in order to distribute the estate, Italian courts needed to figure out what seems like an easy question. Was, what was Nisim Shamama's nationality when he died? So I've already mentioned he might have been Italian. Maybe he actually did get Italian nationality. Maybe he was Tunisian. Maybe he never got Italian nationality and he remained Tunisian. And in fact, two other possible answers arose over the course of the subsequent law school lawsuit, which lasted a decade. So there was a lot of time to come up with different answers. One was that he is he was stateless. He lost his Tunisian citizenship, but he never became Italian. So he was stateless. And the fourth, which I'll talk about a little bit, was that he was Jewish, that Jewishness was a nationality, that Jews had their own national law, which is Jewish law or halakha, and thus that Basically, it doesn't really matter if he was Tunisian or Italian, but really he was Jewish. That was his nationality. So Jewish law should be applied to the estate. Now, I, I'm not going to have time to go into all of these equally. Um, and so I will focus today on the arguments for whether Nisim was Italian, um, in part in Francesca's honor, and in part because um, I think it says something really interesting about this moment in Italian history, in Italian Jewish history, in legal history, and in the ways in which people were thinking about nationality and nationalism in this moment in the late 19th century. So let me take a little bit of a break um, from talking about the case and say a little bit more about, oops, sorry, too, too far, say a little bit more about sort of, you know, Basically, why should we care? Why should we care about this obscure Jew, Nisim Shamama, who has this funny name, whom I imagine most of you, not all of you, but most of you hadn't heard of before today. So I, I'll, I'll start by trying to make a pitch for why nationality law is actually really interesting. I venture to imagine that most people, when they hear the term nationality law, they're like, oh boy, nationality law sounds boring, sounds dry you know, definitely something that only like a small 
pocket of the legal profession would be interested in. And similarly, I would say that we tend to think about the question of how do you determine somebody's nationality is a pretty straightforward matter, right? You produce the correct paperwork, you produce a birth certificate, you produce a passport, you produce some other kind of government issued document, right? But neither evidence of nationality, neither the, the process of determining nationality nor nationality law were simple or straightforward in the late 19th century. Some of this is just a simple, is just really boils down to the question of state bureaucracy. States did not have strong enough bureaucracies to issue everybody identity documents um, that would prove nationality in a kind of ubiquitous way until very late, in many cases, until the 20th century. So it was quite common, actually, that when somebody's nationality came into question, there were there was a radical sort of question mark about this issue. Um, Nishim Shamama was definitely not the only person in the 19th century whose nationality was litigated and who, you know, both sides really presented compelling evidence for why he might be Italian or Tunisian or stateless um, or Jewish. Second, and also particularly important when it comes to talking about Mancini, is that debates about nationality law were really not matters left to the dusty shelves of law professors. They were passionately debated because they stood at the heart of nationalism. So I've, always, I've already gestured a little bit to how Mancini was sort of marrying these ideas of nationality and nationalism. Um, and it was, in, but I'll talk more today about how nationality law allowed people like Mancini and other jurists and politicians to draw the boundaries of the nation, not on a map, but legally speaking. And this could work to exclude Jews and it could also work to include them. So this is also really at the heart of the great drama of Jewish history in the 19th century, which is the great drama of what is usually called emancipation, right? The gradual inclusion of Jews into these new, empires and nation states that are arising. So hopefully what I'll convince you of is that first of all, nationality law is not boring or dry. And um, second of all, proving nationality, super interesting. And third of all, this obscure guy Nisim Shamama can actually suggest new ways to think about these really big questions. What it means to belong in 19th century Italy and beyond, and what it means to be Italian and what it means to be Jewish Italian, or what it meant to be Jewish Italian in the 19th century. Okay. Uh, let me go back to the case and let me show you again this picture of, of Aziza um, and just remind you, okay, so Aziza was the one who had the most stake in proving that Nisim Chamama had died in Italian because if the will was upheld, she got uh, she and her family got half of his fortune, right? They had been living this very comfortable life. Um, Nisim Chamama had initially lived in Tunis in this great big palace there where she had lived with him. Then he moved to a very Tony apartment in Paris, finally to Livorno where he built himself another palace. So, you know, she wanted to maintain her lifestyle, um, needless to say. And um, Nisim, uh, let, let's also go back a little bit to Nisim's biography. Unfortunately, this is the only photograph we have of him, which is so bad and blurry. Um, but it tells you something about what he looked like. Anyway, um, so let me tell you a little bit more about this question of how Nisi might or might not have become Italian. So as I mentioned, he moved to Paris in 1864. Um, this was in the middle of a violent rebellion against the Tunisian government for which he was working. That's how he made his money. He was a very high, he sort of rose in the ranks of the Tunisian government, um, first as a tax farmer and then eventually as as a sort of high ranking official in the Ministry of Finance, as the head tax collector for the entire country, et cetera, et cetera. Um, when he got to Paris, he first sort of thought, oh, maybe I'll get French citizenship, but it was hard to get French citizenship quickly unless you were really well connected. Otherwise, you basically had to live there for 10 years. And it seems Nisim wasn't well en enough connected to get French citizenship quickly. So instead, he decided to get Italian citizenship, and he had his lawyer write a letter to the king of Italy, Vittorio Emanuele II, and request first to be made, said first to be made an Italian nobleman, sweetening the deal with a 50,000 lire donation to the Italian government, basically saying, here you go, have this money, do what you will. So it's not exactly a golden passport, but it's basically a golden passport, right? It's essentially buying citizenship. Because then, of course, in this next letter, he says, oh, thank you so much for making the account. 
Um, here's the oh, coat of arms I would like. And by the way, do you mind also making me an Italian citizen? Um, the idea of buying nobility wasn't that odd, actually. Lots of different elites, including Jewish elites, got noble titles um, uh, in this period in the 19th century, often by giving large donations to a particular country. The idea of, of sort of like translating that into citizenship is perhaps somewhat less common, but for these elite um, sort of like mobile Jews and others, it wasn't that difficult to get citizenship somewhere or the other. So it wasn't like Nisim was totally um, bizarre. When he wrote to the Italian, to the to the king of Italy saying, I would like to be a citizen, he mentioned, by the way, actually, you know, I have Livornese ancestors. And I'll talk a little bit more about the connection between Livornese Jews and the Jews in Tunisia a little bit later on. But let's just say this isn't totally outlandish because there was a community of Livornese Jews in Tunisia. Um, so he gets this decree of naturalization from the King of Italy. And from then on, he appears to essentially live publicly as an Italian. He joins an Italian uh, charitable organization in Paris. Um, when he comes to Italy in 1871, in the midst of another violent rebellion, in the midst of the Paris Commune, and um, he moves to Livorno and he declare he um, registers his domicile in Livorno. So he has a notary come, and the notary notes him down as an Italian citizen. Now, it's not like he's providing proof. It's not like they're like, okay, let's see your passport. First of all, passports weren't really a thing as an identity document. You could get a passport, but it functioned more like a visa, and it wasn't considered necessarily proof of who you were. Um, but in any case, you know, nobody seemed to question the fact that he was Italian. And when he died, it's quite clear that um, that everybody assumed he was an Italian. So, of course, Haid Momo, the nephew who was going to be cut out of the will, um, if, if he was declared Italian uh, and the will was applied, was very eager to, to throw some kind of doubt on the Italian citizenship of Nisim Shimama. Now, happily for Momo, he got the Tunisian government in his corner. This wasn't really out of like the Tunisian government's love of Momo, but rather Momo himself had accrued all of these debts to the Tunisian government. The Tunisian government knew that Momo stood to inherit a lot of money from Nisim Shumama, and the Tunisian government forced Momo to sign agree an agreement giving them a large chunk of his inheritance. So the Tunisian government, first of all, became a party to the case, and second of all, had a direct financial interest in making sure that the will was thrown out and Momo inherited a third of the estate. So the Tunisian government um, uh, basically had to become an official party to the state. They sent a representative to Livorno um, and they hired the second most um, famous professor and scholar of, uh, professor and jurist of international law in Livor in Italy, a man named uh, Augusto Pierantoni, who happened to be um, Nisim Shamama's son, in, uh, sorry, Nisim Shamama, who happened to be uh, Mancini's son-in-law. When Aziza figured out that they had this high-powered lawyer who was going to argue that Nisim Shamama had died Tunisian, had never been Italian, um, then she hired Mancini. And then they started, and Mancini became a party to the case, which of course all depended on the nationality principle that he himself had written. And just to, to very quickly summarize the case of the opposition, right, of Momo and the Tunisian government and Perantoni, right, they essentially argued that Nisim Shamama had never fulfilled a clause in the naturalization decree, which said that he had to register his decree of naturalization with Italian authorities and take an oath of loyalty to the Italian state. He had been given six months from the issuance of the decree to do that. He had never done it. So they argued the decree never took action. He thought he was an Italian, but he wasn't actually an Italian. He never became an Italian. Thus, he remained a Tunisian national. Thus, Tunisian law should apply. So Mancini comes in, and Mancini has to prove that Nisim Shamama did die an Italian. And I think his arguments are totally fascinating. So first of all, he begins by saying that the lawyers for the opposing side had completely misunderstood Italian naturalization law. The article in the civil code, which they pointed to, saying that he had to register his Italian naturalization decree and take the oath, 
Article 10 of the Civil Code, if you're interested. This only applies to foreigners. This is for stranieri, foreigners, people who were not Italian. But, Mancini argued, Nisim was not a foreigner because he had claimed Livornese ancestry. And this Livornese ancestry made him what is called an oriundo italiano. An oriundo essentially, it kind of, it doesn't really have a great translation in English, but I think the closest is like an original Italian, so like an Italian by descent, we might say. Um, Oriundi, I, I'll leave it untranslated uh, because I think it is this kind of specific and very specific to this moment in Italian history. Oriundi Italiani, Italiani were not subject to the same naturalization laws as foreigners. For an Oriundo Italiano to, to regain citizenship, because the idea was somehow they had citizenship in their bloodline, maybe their father was a citizen, they were not born a citizen. If they wanted to reclaim their Italian citizenship, they weren't applying as a foreigner. They were just saying, I want to recover something that my family had lost. And all they had to do was move back to Italy, declare their attention to become Italian, and that was it. They would be re-embraced by their homeland. Now, what is going on with this whole approach to Oriundi Italiani? First of all, this sounds pretty generous, right? Like, Anybody who says I'm Italian and I want to be an Italian citizen again can just show up. Needless to say, this is no longer the case. If any of you have Italian descent, this is no longer the applicable law in Italy. Um, but this is part of a moment of irredentism in Italian nationalism. Irredentism meaning this idea that there were parts of Italy that were no longer part of the nation, that were not yet part of the nation state. And Mancini really... Um, wanted to say that these Italians who lived elsewhere in the Mediterranean rightly belonged to the nation state of Italy. So let's think about the Papal States, right? The Papal States didn't actually become part of Italy until 1870, five years after the Civil Code was written. So the idea was but when they wrote the Civil Code, they didn't know that the Papal States were going to be conquered in 1870. So the idea was that people living in the Papal State who wanted to move to Italian territory shouldn't be considered foreigners. They shouldn't be considered non-Italian. They spoke Italian, well, or some dialect of Italian just as well as anybody else, just as well as Sicilians, certainly actually much better. I mean, if you consider, if you talk about, like, if you want to think about the sort of internal hierarchies of Italianita, of, of Italianness. And um, and even after the Papal States were reduced to the walls of Vatican City, right, nationalists continued to hope for the annexation of these parts of Italy, some of which became part of Italy, like Trieste, later was at the time part of the Austro-Hungarian Empire, and some of which the Fiume only briefly became part of Italy and then went back to other states. Um, so the idea of this Oriundi Italiani, the idea of these special laws for Oriundi Italiani was um, they were designed specifically with the hope that these regions where they believed Italians lived would I eventually be incorporated into the Italian state. And in the meanwhile, they wanted to allow Italians who really burned with the blood of Italian nationalism to join the Italian nation. And so Mancini really defended this policy. He explained at one point, quote, citizenship did not necessarily follow the political borders of the state, but could go well beyond them, end quote. So a Jew of Livornese descent who happened to have been born in Tunisia was part of this greater vision of Italianness that went well beyond the borders of the Italian state. And Mancini was very happy to argue Nisim Shamama was never a foreigner. He was an oriundo italiano. He never actually needed to apply for naturalization. Maybe he didn't know that. Maybe he did it just to be safe. But he needs to be considered an Italian because he moved to Livorno. He established his residency here. Clearly, he wanted to be an Italian citizen. So whether he filed the proper paperwork and took the proper oaths is honestly doesn't matter. It's not required by the law. More broadly, this whole argument is part of Mancini's focus on blood and descent as crucial to nationality, which is a broader issue in 19th century nationalism, for sure. Mancini had always argued, since he kind of made his name on the nationalist scene, he'd always argued that nationality was more than just a choice. It was something integral to a person, to his spirit, to his being. It was 
it was some things that one could change, like language, you could learn a new language, um, culture, you could learn a new culture, religion, you could change religion, but it was also based on things that were biological, that were hard to change. Um, and nationality was strong, was so strong because it created, quote, a particular intimacy of relations that is impossible to find among people of different nations. He really, for him, the nation was a family and it had the same kind of biological meaning as a family. And, and this is, of course, why nationality was so important to Mancini and why he insisted on the nationality principle in the first place. Because if nationality was impossible to change, if it ran in your blood, right, then we couldn't have Italians dying in France. We couldn't have them subject to French law, foreign law. They had to be, their, their nationality, their national law had to be respected abroad. And for him, Nisim Shimana had this Italian blood. He was part of this biological Italian nation. And thus he had a kind of almost inherent right to Italian nationality. Again, paperwork be damned, essentially. Finally, I want to talk about Mancini's insistence that a Jew like Nisim Shamama be included in this vision of Italianness, because this was not obvious among Italian nationalists and Italian politicians in the 19th century. Now, again, Nisim Shamama, widely known to be from Tunisia, where there was this community of Livornese Jews, who, by the way, were called Grana. Um, and I'll just note that, um, you know, as far as the opposition was concerned, Nisim Shamama in Tunisia had never declared that he was a member of the Grana community. There was absolutely no evidence that he was part of this Livornese Jewish community in Tunisia that had its own separate synagogue, its own separate butchers, its own separate cemetery, its own separate communal organization, at least from 1720, when there was a split between the Grana, the, the Livornese Jews in, Tunis and, in Tunisia, and the Twansa, which is, which is Arabic for Tunisian Jews, the local Jews. However, from the perspective of Italian lawyers and Italian bureaucracy, this seemed unimportant, right? It was like, okay, yes, there is a Livornese Jewish community in Tunisia. He says he's Livornese, fine, like, no, no problem. I mean, of course, the opposition pointed out that in Tunisia he had never been considered Livornese, but Mancini just basically ignored that completely. For Mancini, right, as I've said, he had this sort of broader vision of Italianita, and these Livornese Jews should be included in it. In fact, this is not so far-fetched because earlier in the 19th century, Livornese Jews had really activated their sense of connection to Italy. They had essentially gotten permission to, re to have a kind of um, uh, sort of, you know, uh, en masse uh, naturalization, essentially, as first Tuscan, right? Because this actually happened before the unification of Italy. So they were all declared to be Tuscan subjects. And then that in 1861, when Tuscany became part of Italy, that turned into Italian signature. So there was a large group of people in Tunisia who were Italian citizens. But for Mancini, the question of Nisim's Italianness was also a way of fighting a battle at home about the place of Jews in the new Italian nation state. One of the most frequent anti-Semitic charges against Jews in Italy and elsewhere, by the way, this was not unique to Italy, but this was a, a, an issue that came up in particular in Italy shortly before the Shamama case, um, was this idea that Jews had doppio nazionalità, double nationality, that Jewishness was a nationality, it was its own nationality, and thus Jews could never be fully Italian. They could never really fully belong to the Italian nation. Now, interestingly, this dovetails very closely with one of the arguments made in the Shamama case, which I mentioned earlier, that Nisim Shamama was neither Italian nor Tunisian, but that Jewishness was his nationality and that Jewish law was his nationality law. Um, and the lawyers working on the opposite side of the case you know, their main argument was that Nisim Shmama had died a Tunisian, but they kind of made the secondary argument to, to say, well, okay, if you don't believe us about the Tunisian thing, then for somebody who, let's say, died stateless, we shouldn't apply Italian law because he has a national law. He is Jewish. He, he is, he, Judaism is a nation, uh, is a nationality, and Jewish law is a national law. And one of the sort of local um, Tuscan lawyers working on this case, a guy named Leopoldo Galeotti, 
who wasn't nearly as famous as Mancini and Ferrantoni, but who had a pretty big reputation in Tuscany and who himself was a senator, you know, a politician. Um, he took on this argument. He says Jews are a nation. They lack a state, yes, but they are still a nationality. They have a national law. And interestingly, Gagliotti was arguing this not in an anti-Semitic way. He actually was very sort of pro the full inclusion of Jews in the Italian state. He had even defended Jews, but he was more to the right of Mancini. He was much friendlier towards the Catholic Church, and he was just friendlier towards religious groups in general. Um, and so he was sort of willing to argue that Jews, yeah, they were sort of their own nation. They should be full Italians in general in Italy. But in this case, we can recognize that Nishim Shamama might have died a Jewish national, and thus Jewish law should apply. This was all very difficult for somebody like Mancini, because Mancini's breakout book had basically made the argument that nationality should matter whether or not there was a nation state involved. In other words, people should respect somebody's nationality, even if there was no nation state. And Jews seem like the obvious example of a nation without a nation state. He ultimately kind of had to, you know, do all of these sort of intellectual calisthenics to try to um, basically get around his own argument and ultimately basically says the Jews, okay, yeah, they're basically a nation or they were a nation, um, but they ultimately lost their full status as a nation because they don't have a region anymore. Um, and, and now they have been absorbed by other nations. So it, after the diaspora, Jews have been absorbed by other nations, hence why Italian Jews are fully Italian. Um, there's a lot more I could say about this case, but I want to leave plenty of time for discussion. And I also want to tell you a little bit about sort of the denouement of the case. And I'll just end by saying that the, this question of was Nisim Shumama Italian or not really boiled down to these big questions of how do you define Italianness and how do you draw the borders of the Italian nation, not the physical borders, but the jurisdictional borders? Who is a member of Italy, a, a member of the citizens of Italy, and who is not? And how do Jews fit into that? Are Jews their own nation? Are they not? If they are their own nation, can they also be Italian, et cetera? And so this is just a, a kind of just for the historian that, that this is like part of what I'm doing with using this kind of micro history to bring us to these much bigger questions um, about Jewish history, about legal history, um, et cetera. So I'll, I, I probably shouldn't tell you the outcome of the case so that you all go out and buy the book, but I'll tell you a little bit about it and I'll sort of simplify it. So part of what's interesting, since I've spent so much time talking about Mancini, part of what's interesting is that actually no court bought his argument. No court ever ruled that Nisim was an Italian, even though here was literally the most famous lawyer of international law in the entire country. Um, it's hard to know why, right? What, why, why, perhaps it was ultimately kind of a question of, you know, how people imagined Italianness, right? Here was this Jew from Tunisia who didn't speak Italian, who had never spoken Italian, dressed dressed in sort of Tunisian clothes, right, as we see in that picture, and who spoke Arabic, um, who wrote in Judeo-Arabic, right? Maybe it was just hard to think about Nisim Shamama as an Italian, right? Maybe that just really seemed like a stretch. Finally, the court in Florence, which is the final court to rule, on the case in 1883, determined that Nisim Shamama had died a Tunisian, um, and thus that Jewish law did apply to his state. There's a whole other long conversation about the, the question of whether Nisim's will was kosher according to Jewish law, which I'm happy to talk about in the question and answer if you'd like. But by the time the, the um, court in Florence had ruled on the case, all of the people involved, Aziza, Momo, Joseph, Nathan, even the Tunisian government, everybody had run out of money because they'd been paying these fancy lawyers very high fees. You know, they'd been keeping up appearances in Livorno. Um, and so this guy, the Baron Emile Deranger, who was a French banker of German Jewish origin, who himself was Catholic, but was widely perceived as Jewish, um, and who had had a sort of sordid history, well, various sordid histories. He, he made his money initially as the banker to the Confederacy, married the daughter of a Confederate senator. Um, eventually, he made even more money uh, with these sort of usurious loans to the Tunisian government, which ultimately bankrupted Tunisia. 
So Emir Dallonger had known Nisim Shamama during the lifetime, he knew about the case, and he quietly sent agents to Livorno and Tunis to buy up the various shares of the inheritance from all the possible heirs, such that in the end, Allonger owned everything and got all of the money from the estate, and everybody else just got the small bits that Allonger had paid them out as an advance. So it's a tragedy in which the only winners were bankers and lawyers. If you're a lawyer and a banker, maybe you don't see that as so tragic. The Shamama case offers what I think is a new perspective on what might seem like a, a simple question. When we think about what makes someone Italian, and particularly what makes somebody who is Jewish Italian, we usually think about this sort of simple binary of in or out, right? Citizen or foreigner. And that is, in fact, I would argue how most historians of citizenship have thought about citizenship in general as what is often called social closure, right? A closure between those who are members and those who are not members. But Nisim lived his life across that imagined binary. He claimed Livornese ancestry, but he doesn't, he clearly wasn't actually a member of the Grana community in Tunisia. Um, he lived his life as an Italian citizen, but he never spoke Italian, continued to dress, and in many ways it seems act like a Tunisian. And he didn't clearly fit the molds of what it meant to be an Italian, even despite the impressive arguments made by high-powered lawyers like Mancini. So what I want to argue is that Nisim Shamama's life suggests that belonging in general, belonging in Tunisia, belonging in 19th century Italy, and I would argue across the 19th century Mediterranean, was not a binary, but rather a spectrum of possible outcomes. And with that, I will finish and welcome any questions you may have. Thank you so much, Jessica, for this really, uh, really, really stimulating talk. Um, you know, you, you touch on so many very interesting points. Um, it just, it, it, you know, I'm in the process of getting Italian citizenship for my child. And of course, Italian citizenship today is based on uh, the, it's based on, on you sandwich, right? The, 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 the law of blood. Uh, whereas in the U.S. it's based both on sanguinis and you solid, so the or you solid the, the the law of the land or the law of being having been born there, and the law of, of blood, uh, so, so to speak. So it's been it's a it's very stimulating for me to think about these these issues today, you know, across so many different legal uh, legal systems. Um, I, I have a question just to open up as we're waiting for other people to either type out their questions or raise their hands to Zoom. Um, and one has to do, I have actually have two questions. One has to do with the final ruling of the Italian courts, the, the final court of appeal that decides, um, right, if I understand correctly, that this thing is, is Jewish, this thing is not Italian. Um, can you tell us a little bit more about that? And sure. then second, you have to, uh, you know, your investigation brought you to archives all over. Uh, so tell us more about the detective work and uh, the kind of archival sources that you do your work with. Yeah, great. Um, and I'll just ask, I'm sorry, I'm, I, I, I was telling Francesca and Arlen, I'm having a bit of a computer crisis. So I'm, I'm, I'm on a loner computer and I can't figure out how to turn the volume up. So if you speak your question, I'll just ask you to speak it loudly um, to make sure that I hear you well. So, okay, so the first question, so so uh, yeah, and I see in the chat also that Diane has said, did, did I say that he was ultimately declared a Tunisian? Yes, so ultimately the, the court in Florence, the final court that ruled, did declare him a Tunisian. And they essentially said, Mancini is a smart guy, but I, we don't buy his arguments. And they basically kind of doubled down on this need to file the paperwork because Nishim Shamama had never sort of submitted the paperwork of his naturalization degree. He just hadn't become Italian. They did consider this question, was he Jewish? Was Judaism a nationality? And they essentially said, well, Ju Judaism may be a kind of you know cultural or ethnic nationality, but there's no state. So it's not a nationality for our purposes. So again, kind of rejected and in that sense, they kind of agreed with Mancini more or less. 
So they ultimately decided that Nisim Shmama had died Tunisian, which meant that they had to apply Jewish law. And that proved its own big saga. And parallel to the, the discussions going on in the Italian courts, there had been a discussion among rabbis all over the Mediterranean over concerning whether Nisim's will was valid according to halakha or not. And so shortly after Nisim died, the Haham Bashi, the chief Ottoman rabbi of Palestine, a guy named Ashkenazi, confusingly, because he was not Ashkenazi, he was Sephardi. Um, uh, rabbi Ashkenazi, Abraham Ashkenazi, wrote a teshuvah, a responsum, arguing that Nisim Shamama's will was valid according to Jewish law, even though it appeared to lack really all of the things that generally made a kosher will. He made all of these complicated arguments for why it was valid. Um, then there was a counter teshuva, a counter responsum written by other rabbis, and then many, then there was a proliferation, right? Rabbis writing uh, mostly in Hebrew on in Tunisia, in Salonika, um, writing haskamot or agreements really all over the Mediterranean, in France, even in Eastern Europe. Uh, and this sort of debate went on alongside what was going on in the courts. But when the court finally decided, yeah, he had died a Tunisian, then they had to rule on what Jewish law said about Nisim Shamama's will. And this was not unknown, right? Actually, there's, I'm, I'm working now on looking more into the history of non-Jewish courts adjudicating matters of Jewish law, right? It was fairly common in early modern Europe um, and uh, to some degree in the Islamic world. And um, so, you know, here with this Italian, these Italian judges, and they essentially relied mainly on legal briefs written by Italian Jews. So both sides by this point knew that it might be a possibility that Jewish law would apply. So they had both hired people to write briefs in Italian, kind of that would be translatable to the Italian court. Um, and the guy who had written on Aziza's side was very famous. His name was Elia Ben Amozeg. Um, so if you know anything about Italian Jewish history, he was sort of one of the most important Italian Jewish thinkers of the late 19th century, born and raised and lived his entire life in Livorno, um, and not known as a halachist, not known as a jurist at all, um, really known as a theorist, a philosopher. But he wrote this legal brief, essentially, arguing that Nisim Shamama's will was valid according to Jewish law. Um, and then also some non-rabbis um, who were lawyers, but learned enough somehow about Jewish law, they were Jews themselves, also wrote another brief basically explaining why the will was valid according to Jewish law. And that is what the judges ultimately relied on. Um, okay, and then let me say, I, I, mean, I, I mean, we can get more into the details of the, of the halachic dispute if you'd like. So feel free to, to ask for more of that, but I don't want to overwhelm everybody with lots of, lots of legalese. Um, the, the question of archives is a fun one. So I, you know, I came across this case, I think actually, Francesca, you were there at the very first presentation I ever gave on this case, like long before I'd really been to the archives. Um, and I knew very little about it, except what I was able to get from printed materials, some of which is available on like databases, um, or on sort of, you know, libraries, digital collections. Um, but I, I didn't even know really whether I would write a whole book about this case. I thought maybe I would just write an article until I went to the Tunisian archives where somebody had told me, that, you know, there was one article about Nisim Shamama essentially at the time um, and one dissertation chapter, but the dissertation chapter really just relied on, on the Hebrew printed material. So that one article cited some material in the Tunisian archives. So I went. And, you know, you don't you never know exactly what you're going to find when you get to an archive. And it turned out that they were just boxes and boxes and boxes of files about this one case. I mean, it just endless more than I I knew I already I wasn't ever going to be able to read it all. So I started going through that. And then I realized that I would also have to go to Italy and I would have to get the Italian side of things. I went to France and got the French side of things. I went to the Ottoman archives in Istanbul because Tunisia was a semi-autonomous province of the Ottoman Empire. So Ottoman officials got involved at various points. Um, and it became this sort of fun way to try to tell one story, but from all of these different archival perspectives. Um, and it was really, yeah, that was great. And it brought me to new, right, so I'd never worked in Italian archives before. That was really an adventure and it was super fun. Um, 
And uh, yeah, no, I, I mean, I, 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 uh, I'm, I'm now embarking on another project that is very transnational and involves triangulating amongst even more archives, probably too many archives for my own good. But I think I kind of got this, this, um, the taste for these projects that require you to look from different sides of the Mediterranean, right, from the Tunisian side and from the Italian side. And it was really, um, it was, it's really, I think thrilling in terms of what you can see um, about law on the ground and how it gets argued. Jessica, thanks so much for that really riveting uh, presentation. Um, we'll take the next question from uh, Marwen, um, who asks, uh, did Italian law have any relationship to Catholic canon law? Um, if so, did that relationship shape this case in any- no, Sorry, that, that is Shari. Shari. Ah. Oh, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Oh, I'm sorry. I was reading the wrong question. Okay. We, we'll go we to can take Marwan's that question, question and then we can take Marwan's. That's fine. Yeah. Um, okay. Go ahead. Um, did Can you read it? I'll, let me finish. Yeah. No, I see it in the chat. Right. So, um, so the question of did Italian law have any relation to the Catholic Catholic canon law? That's a great question. Um, I mean, the, the easy answer is no. And, you know, part of what happens with the drafting of the civil code in 1865 is that it's part of this nationalist vision um, that was primarily um, sort of, you know, very liberalist um, in the kind of classic sense of the term. So there was a there was a real um, people like Mancini, who were at the center of, of drafting the civil code, really wanted a separation of church and state. And in Italy, this, you know, was particularly important given the Pope and the fact that the Pope had been the head of state for the papal states and that other parts of Italy had belonged to the Catholic empire. You know, so it was a very it was a place where the entanglement of religious uh, of Catholic religious and political authority loomed large. So there, so the civil code, you know, is is not at all public. Um, and in that sense, you know, the suspicion of his citizenship connected to a vision of Italian citizenship is specifically Catholic, not in the legal domain. That was never a legal argument that was made. As I said, I do think that there might have been a kind of unspoken sense of prejudice, which I'll never be able to prove, because these are things that are really hard to get at, right? But there might nonetheless have been a certain sort of expectation of what an Italian Jew looked like, or what an Italian looked like, which I think maybe had less to do with his Jewishness, um, because everybody involved in the case was perfectly willing to admit that a Jew could be Italian, and more to do with his Tunisianness, right? And that has to do, I think, more less with a kind of Catholic versus Jew divided, more with a European versus non-European, right? Christian nations versus the Islamic world, the Islamic world. And there, I think, you know, again, this is not something I'll ever be able to prove, but I do have the suspicion that part of the reason the courts maybe never found Nisim Shamama to have been Italian really did have to do with the fact that he was from Tunisia and thus kind of outside of Europe. And that was just imagined as so different, right? So, so radically different from uh, Europeanness. Um, but but I will just say, I mean, just for context, there were definitely people who essentially said, yeah, Jews can never really be fully Italian, or we can never trust them to be fully Italian, because Italianness, Italianita, is deeply connected to Catholicism, um, or at least Christianity. And so, you know, I mentioned this sort of debate over doppio nazionalità. This this came to a head most famously in something called the Pasqualigo affair, where a Jewish um, politician was nominated to be minister, um, and another a, a Catholic politician basically wrote like went nuts and wrote this screed saying a Jew could never should never have such a high position in the government. They can't, we can't trust that person because they have doppio nazionalità, because they are dual nationals. They can never be fully Italian. Um, and, you know, this, this was a real debate. And the Catholic press tended to be by far the most anti-Semitic and by far the most um, 
uh, in the in the second half of the 19th century, by far the most suspicious of Jews' ability to be full members of the Italian state. So, so you're right in the broader context, specifically when it comes to the legal arguments made in the Shimana case. I think partly because lawyers tended to be pretty liberal, partly because neither side wanted a lawyer who was going to be overtly anti-Semitic, right? That wasn't going to serve their case. So the lawyers, all, all of the lawyers involved in the case were either themselves Jewish or very kind of, you know, open-minded when it came to questions of including Jews um, in the broader, in broader citizenship. Um, Arnold, do you, do you, I can also read the questions on the chat. Should I take Marwan's question? Okay, sure, yeah. Marwan, okay, Marwan, Marwan nice to see you. So, right, so he asked, what are the reasons for the legal action of the Tunisian government in the Shamama versus Shamama case, and was it for embezzlement? So, right, so this is part of the backstory, which I didn't really get into, but Nishim Shamama, when he left Tunisia in 1864, um, at the time, it was in the middle of a civil war, and at the time, he was this very high-ranking uh, official. He was sort of the protege of the prime minister, a man named Mustafa Hasnadar, who was very, very powerful for the reign of a number of Bays. Bays were the kind of political heads of Tunis at the time, of Tunisia at the time. Um, and when he left, the official story was he was you know, going on government business. And he went to Paris initially, as I mentioned. And what he did in Paris was try to get another big financial loan for the state of Tunisia to bail them out of what seemed like impending bankruptcy. At the time, it seems like nobody really suspected him of malfeasance. And the most um, famous chronicler of Tunisia, basically wrote that, yeah, he was really afraid there were people attacking him um, because the rebels against the government kind of blamed him for the tax raises that had caused the civil war in the first place. And so he was afraid, you know, he was worried about his 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 safety, um, but he wasn't leaving, at least according to, to this chronicle, he wasn't leaving out of fear of his relationship with the Tunisian government, he was on great terms with the Bay. He went to the Bay and said, look, I'm worried. Can you, is it okay if I leave? And the Bay was like, sure, go ahead, you know, go in peace. Later on, and I think this was in large part under the influence of a French politician who was appointed to take over the finances of the Tunisian state after it did declare bankruptcy, a few years after Nisim Shamama left. And this French finan financier, or rather finance minister, um, was really had it out for Nisim Shamama's patron, Mustafa Khaznadar, and basically blamed all of Tunisia's fin financial trouble on Khaznadar and kind of put Nisim Shamama in the same category. And later on, the Tunisian government, he essentially accused Nisim Shamama of having been corrupt along with Khaznadar and thus having embezzled a bunch of state funds. So later on, after, Tunis after Nisim Shamama died, the Tunisian government tried to recoup some of the money that it said Nisim Shamama owed the treasury. Now, they should have just applied to the estate and said, here, are, here is the money that Nisim Shamama owed to the state treasury. Here's what he took illegally. Here's what he owed. And that could have been distributed by the Italian courts to, you know, out of his estate. That's normally what you do if you're a creditor. You basically provide proof of the debt that is owed to you, and then the, the, the legal officials overseeing the estate will pay you out. The Tunisian government just could not get together proof of their claim of what Nisim Shalama took. Does that mean he was innocent? Probably not. Does that mean maybe he didn't take quite as much as they claimed? Perhaps, yeah. Um, and in any case, you know, they essentially decided that it didn't matter because they were going to pursue their claims through the debts owed to them by Momo. And they were going to essentially get Momo as a kind of backdoor to getting a piece of Nisim Shamama's estate. Um, they tried to also get Joseph and Nathan very hard, right? As soon as Nisim Shamama died, they called Joseph and Nathan to the Bardo, the palace of the bay, and they said, here's this document, you should sign this. And Nisim and Joseph were like, wait, we don't want, what is this? You know, we are, we're not just going to sign and anything. It turned out it was a contract like the one that Momo had been forced to sign, handing over a quarter of their share of the estate to the Tunisian government. And they actually went to the Italian consul and was like, will you please protect us from the Tunisian government? We're just trying to make us sign this contract and the Tunisian consul agreed. I mean, the Italian consul agreed. So they stayed at the Italian consulate until they were essentially spirited away to Livorno. And um, so the Tunisian government was also kind of, 
you know, trying to pursue all of these back doors, some of which succeeded and some of which failed. In the end, the Tunisian government managed to cut a deal with Deflanger to get a fairly high percentage of the eventual payout of the estate. So they actually did okay. They got they got a fair amount of what they had hoped to get from the estate. Um, but uh, the question of whether Nisim Shamama embezzled state funds is, uh, unfortunately, I really wanted to be able to figure it out and I just was never able to. I mean, my best guess is that he embezzled some. I think most officials did at the time. I think, you know, I think he wasn't like, you know, exceptional in that regard. Um, and that is, you know, part of the story for sure. Yeah. Um, I'm going to exercise my prerogative and uh, ask a question myself. Um, Jessica, just again, you know, the really fascinating talk, so many interlocking pieces. It's it's just, it's it's, it's so interesting to think about how all of these things come together. Um, this isn't a particularly well-formulated question, so I apologize in advance, but I'm really intrigued by the intersection of uh, law and gender here. Um, and just sort of thinking about how the fate of Aziza uh, kind of intersects with kind of nationalism um, mm -hmm. and the establishment of sort of national law and, um, is, can you say more about that, or um, is 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 there kind of more that 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 relates to this case, or in, in other sort of parallel things that you could comment on? Yeah, I can say a little bit more about that. Um, you know, in some ways, um, the the story is very gendered um, and it, it's it's also really about family, right? In some ways, this is really a story about, about chosen family because Nisim adopted Aziza. He wasn't, a, a Jewish law doesn't have a formal mechanism of adoption, um, but he did, he did everything short of that, right? He brought her to live with him. He bought her property. She named her son after him. I mean, there was, you know, there was clearly a real sense of a parent-child relationship. And it's clear that that's what he intended to honor in his will, right? That's that's what he wrote the will to do. Um, one of the sort of challenges, I would say, in, in trying to bring out the gendered aspect of the story is that I've done some methodological work to make Aziza more of a central player than she was in the legal discourse. Because in the legal documents from all of these Italian courts, Aziza is always represented by her husband, Moshe, um, who's also a Shamama. Um, and she never shows up in court. And, you know, you hear, if you hear what seems to be an echo of her voice, it's always written through these male members of the family. You know, one could um, dispute my sort of historical methodology in trying to recoup some of her own agency in navigating this legal system, um, you know, by saying, well, you don't actually know what she was thinking. Maybe she did just sit passively and let her husband do everything. Maybe she just, you know, locked herself away in the house and said, Moshe, you take care of it. And, and Moshe just did all of the, you know, wrangling. But I just... That just strikes me as impossible. Um, I think Moshe was involved, but I think she was really, you know, she was the one who had created this filial bond and Nisim had left her the money, not Moshe, which is also in itself interesting because, right, especially in Europe at the time, married women didn't typically, you know, in certain places like in France, a married woman couldn't even really own property, right? It, it was part of her husband. She couldn't really control it. Um, so, and that's not the case in Jewish law exactly, um, but you know, there's there's a real kind of um, sense in which it was Aziza and not Moshe who was at the center of the legal drama, and I tried to kind of tease that out as much as I could. The other gendered aspect, which I didn't talk about at all in the presentation, but which comes up a little bit in the book, and which you know I could have written even more about, but only so much you can do, um, is Nisim's widow. So Nisim, as I mentioned, he was married three times. He first marries in Tunis. His first wife dies. He marries a second time. And he and the second wife just don't get along. Not clear exactly what happens. He marries a third time without divorcing that second wife. Um, and this young wife actually comes to Paris with him. But then they don't get along either, and they divorce. But he's still never divorced the first wife, who stays behind in Tunisia. She actually moves to Sousse, which is a city in the south of Tunisia or south of Tunis, 
Um, and as soon as Nisim dies, like literally the next day, she sends a telegram to Livorno appointing a local lawyer as her with with power of attorney, basically as her legal representative to ensure her interests in the estate. Now, what are her interests in the estate? Um, first of all, Nisim leaves her a pretty nice sum, 100,000 francs. I mean, it's not nearly as much as he leaves Aziza, um, but it's, you know, it's not nothing. Um, and it certainly covers, because there is a certain amount that under Jewish law, a man is supposed to pay his wife, you know, upon either divorce or death, usually called the ketubah, not the ketubah in the sense of the marriage contract, but the legal obligation um, of, a, of a man towards his wife. Um, so that would certainly cover that, right? So under Jewish law, he would sort of be good. Um, but she also finds out through this lawyer with whom she is in touch in Livorno that if Nisim is declared to have died Italian, she gets not only this 100,000 francs in the will, but also a third of the usufruct of his estate, which is a lot, you know, that he's a rich guy. So that's a lot of money. So she joins with Aziza in this kind of broader, like team of relatives who are trying to get the will upheld, right? And she eventually sends her nephew, she's never had children, Clearly, by the way, the biological problem was Nisi, it was not his wives, right? Because three marriages and he couldn't have kids. So anyway, she but she remained married to Nisi. So she never had children, but she had these nephews whom she was very close with and who were her legal heirs. So she sends one to Livorno. He installs himself in Livorno and basically works to um, try to kind of, you know, support Aziza's legal team. And eventually, a couple of years after Nisi dies, um, Masoda, the widow in Seuss, also dies, and then her nephew becomes her heir, and then he's pursuing the claim on the estate in his own name. Um, so her claim also, like even though it's run, it's sort of represented by men, she, even more clearly than Aziza, she from afar is really pulling all of these behind the scenes strings to make sure that her legal interests um, are respected. You know, in the end, he does get something, this nephew, because the will is eventually upheld. But he, too, has ultimately kind of run out of money and sold off his rights to the bankers. So in the end, he's also part of this broader kind of tragic story of the of the dissolution of the estate. We, we do have a little bit of time left. Are there any other questions? I think one, I'll ask a, a very broad question, but one of the interesting themes that comes out from the book is this difference between citizenship and nationality. Um, do, do you want to tell us a little bit more about your thoughts on that? Yeah. How maybe your thinking changed over time as you were working on the book? Oh, absolutely. Yeah, my changing, my my thinking changed enormously over time. <laughs> yeah. So, I mean, I think I'll say, first of all, like, you know, I think for most people, citizenship and nationality as legal categories are largely kind of synonyms. Um, I think many people would think of nationality as having both a kind of legal dimension and a more ethnocultural dimension. So in the in the book, I kind of talk about ethnocultural nationality as more of a sense of, you know, belonging, culture, ethnicity, language, right, nationality that is the basis of nationalism, but isn't necessarily like a legal bond with a state. Um, for lawyers today, there is a technical distinction between nationality and citizenship. Citizenship implies full legal, uh, full civil and political rights in the state of which one is a member, and nationality implies just a bare bones connection, right? Um, so if you, you know, today most states have really there is no distinction, right? Most states, if you're a member, then you have full rights, but it's not true across the board. So even in America, right, we still have colonies, believe it or not, we still have colonial territories. If you think of Samoa, people who live in Samoa are American nationals, but they are not citizens, which means that they can come to America, but if they get here, they don't have the right to vote. Puerto Ricans are a different thing. They are citizens, but if they stay in Puerto Rico, they don't have full representation of political rights. So they are even yet somewhere in between. So, you know, when I started this project, 
I was sort of very flummoxed, actually. I had a lot of trouble figuring it out. And I had a lot of trouble in large part because that very technical distinction between citizenship and nationality, which Histor which lawyers and legal historians tend to assume is just clear across the board, that didn't yet exist in 1870s Italy, right? People were using nationality and citizenship largely as synonyms. And if they were trying to make distinctions between them, they weren't necessarily making them in the ways that we think. So for instance, there's one point in the case in which an a lawyer argues that a national and a citizen is actually the same thing. A national and a citizen means a full member of the state. And a subject is different. A subject is somebody who belongs to the state, owes loyalty to the sovereign, but doesn't have full rights. And that lawyer makes the argument that Nisim Shumama never was a Tunisian because Jews are not full members of the polity in an Islamic country where you know Islamic law reigns and they're dhimmis, they're sort of second class citizens or whatever. So, they're, so Nisim Shumama was never a citizen slash national. He was a subject and thus Tunisian national law was never his national law because really he needs to be considered stateless. He was always stateless. Um, and in that sense, Jews are the kind of quintessential stateless cosmopolitans who never really belong fully where they, where they live. Um, finally, what I kind of came up with is an alternative to the sort of linguistic or terminological soup that felt like I was just mired in it, right? Nationality, citizenship, everybody seems to mean a different thing, right? So I decided that to pull away from um, these terms which were being used in different ways at the time and instead to think about a, a kind of neutral category that I came up with, which is legal belonging. And legal belonging really just means the bond between an individual and a state. So it might be citizenship, it might be full rights, it might be nationality, which is a formal bond between the citizen and the state, but you know doesn't convert, co doesn't convey rights. Um, it might be even more tenuous. So in the Mediterranean, you had people who had the protection of a state but weren't members of the state, but nonetheless they were, they did in some ways legally belong and were under the jurisdiction of the state. And then you might have the most tenuous, which are people like those, like Nathan and Joseph, the Shamama nephews, who ended up in the Italian consulate under the protection of the Italian consul, not because they had formal consular protection, not because they were Italian nationals, definitely not citizens, but because they were literally physically in the consulate and the consulate provided a kind of what's known in Arabic as horm, a kind of sanctuary, which essentially gave you temporary claim on the Italian state while you were in the wall. So as long as the consul didn't kick them out, they were under Italian protection by virtue of physically being in the consulate. Um, so this idea of legal belonging, and this has to do with what I said at the end of, of you know, belonging as a spectrum, right? I really started, I had this kind of aha moment where I was like, ah, it isn't a binary. It isn't citizen or not citizen. It isn't citizen or national. It isn't subject or national, right? These are all different points along a spectrum. And if we understand it that way, then the argument suddenly makes sense. Um, and then, you know, we're, we're, we have a way of kind of approaching the different terminology that is in the process of getting worked out from a kind of more neutral perspective and understanding how different people's use of different terms fall along this broader spectrum. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Jessica. Um, I think that's a, a great place to um, call, call this event to, to a close. Um, along with uh, my colleague Francesca, please join me in, in, in thanking uh, Professor Jessica Margolin for a, a really great talk today. Um, Francesca, do you want to put the um, the code in the chat one more time? Yes, um, let me let me put the code one more time. Here. Hopefully, we've 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 wet your appetite, and um, you'll all go out and buy the book. Um, I will also uh, put in the chat um, the website for the Queens College Center for Jewish Studies. Um, uh, um, we have a very interesting talk coming up on March 13th um, with uh, Yifat Biton, president of Ahva Academic College, um, who will be talking about the current uh, judicial reform proposals uh, going on in Israel, kind of an urgent issue. So we welcome everyone uh, to join us for that. Um, Francesca, do you want to 
we have a talk coming up on uh, the 16th of March at Quinto Beach in person. Have the Center for Jewish History actually there on 16th Street, and it's the presentation of diary of a Black Jewish Messiah. Wonderful. Okay, so thank you once again. Um, good night, everyone, or have a good day. Good night for me. Yeah. <laughs> good seeing you all. Um, and uh, until next time. Thank, thank you so, you so much. much. Yeah. It was such a pleasure. Bye.